Listen to the rumble. Listen to the roar. Slowly in three. They'll be flying off four. Watch them now. He's like, yeah. All right. Ed, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I, I'm an honored, I'm honored to call you a friend, and I respect your knowledge and your experience is amazing in the racing world. Um, it's the history that your name and your family and you bring to the racing family. The racing fraternity is endless, and uh, it's a pleasure to sit down with you. Well, it's uh, great to. Uh be here josh i mean um that's awful nice of you I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what i'm gonna do here is uh i've got some notes here and i want to go through and i was thinking on the way here if we try to do the history of your family it will be here for three hours and what i want to do is that i've got topics i'm going to talk about in the history of your family and what you've done and your dad and your uncle has done will come out in the in these stories yeah fine whatever um, you want to talk yeah about. it's basically i want to ex explain that uh there's three brothers ed zeke and gus and ed i'm assuming was your dad that's right and zeke and gus were your uncles right and uh it's Gus was uh, involved in a, a car accident when he was in his 20s? 21. Okay. Right. And got, which... got thrown out of a car and, and was paralyzed from the waist down, told he wouldn't live past 30. Wow. And uh, people who uh, have any sort of paralysis, one of the th problems is infection. Okay. And, uh, you know, bladder infection, et cetera, and, you know, that type of stuff can be I mean, it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, and we're that talking was this was 1930s, 1920s. Yeah, 1930s. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, you know, it was a t standard scenario. Uh, he got thrown out of the car, and of course, they came over and hey, get up, you know. Oh, and, geez, yeah. You know, it's yeah, it, 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 it different time. Nobody knew. Yeah, nobody knew any better, and and all that, and they didn't have you know those hard boards, and <laughs> I mean, yeah, look, yeah, they, didn't, they didn't. They didn't. Yeah, to be like, honest, I, I don't think they had much of an emergency room back in that era. You know, that's that's funny. It just all of a sudden occurred to me. It's nothing I really researched, but he was out in the middle of farm country. You know, I mean, uh, that's that's real. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. So anyway, yeah, yeah, that was his that was his lot. He was the oldest of the brothers and the tallest, and uh, the only one to, that went to college. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't uh, finish. Uh, but so he, he was sort of like, you might say the favored son, uh, of my grandfather, uh, who I never knew, uh, because, you know, he was just the oldest and the first, yeah. first born son. Now right. he was the fourth child because they had three older sisters. So okay. anyway, cool. At some point, uh, and clarify the year, Ed and Zeke go to California. To, for the cal for the basically the car scene, I know Ed went first, and he had some riders with him. <laughs> That's it. That's right. Yeah. No, my dad. Look at my dad. Um, first of all, I, I, it's important to sort of uh, recognize that at that time, California was advertising for people to move out there. As crazy as that sounds to people who live in California now, because of the number of people we have out there, yeah. it's true. And there are these brochures, and they'd run ads in the, the magazines, and, hey, uh, we'll, you know, write to the California Department of, uh, you know, bringing people in or whatever the heck they called it, and uh, we'll send you a brochure about all the reasons why you want to move to California, which sounds really, again, crazy in today's world, but that's the way it was. Well, my dad, when they were growing up in the Midwest, uh, in a small town south of Kansas City, uh, he just was so all over the movie uh, scene, movie stars, the palm trees, the beaches, and the cars that were in California because of the weather. And, uh, you know, that's been the thing for California. Really, I think the underlying thing for a lot of this was the weather. And uh, he just, you know what, he was, he was ready to leave his town. 
he had soaked this up. I mean, uh, it, it had so brainwashed him that as soon as he got uh, out of school and he went to Fry Aircraft School in Kansas City, which was started by a guy by the name of Donald Fry, his brother Jack was one of the founders of uh, what would become TWA. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were, they, yeah. Were, they were icons and legends in early aviation in America. And Donald Fry was the brother that created all these aircraft, uh, you know, mechanic schools and all. And he had them across the U.S. And so a friend of my dad's uh, showed him an ad and convinced my dad that this would be the great thing. And so my dad did that and found out, you know, that a lot of the aircraft companies, Douglas, et cetera, were all in California. And so that's when he got his buddies to pay him 25 bucks each and they drove out <laughs> Route 66. And uh, once he got out there, my dad was the, the baby of the family. He was the youngest of six, the youngest of the boys, obviously, too. And he went to work on trying to move the rest of the family to California. This is where it's at. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and ultimately, he, he achieved that. But the first one to come was my Uncle Zeke, and, as uh, you mentioned. Yeah. And then what I was, because you've got a book out on your family. And right. It, and the name of the book is The Legacy of Justice. Right. And That's right. Available amazing. on Amazon.com. There I you go. I highly recommend it. The, the, the history that book covers. Um, and I read in there that shortly, as uh, soon as Zeke showed up, he went to work for Joel Thorne. Yeah, you know, team. He, he, I, there's a, there's a, uh, in the book, Tom Madigan makes the observation that my dad and uncles were sort of like Forrest Gump, which is, he got that from me because I said, <laughs> and I watched Forrest Gump coming back here on the airplane, <laughs> by the way. It, it was available, and I go, you know, I need to watch that film again. Be, and it's just so true. You know, the, the story of Forrest, he just ends up, he's just stumbling through life, you know. <laughs> life is like a box of chocolate, you know. And, I mean, he's a, Forrest is sort of a simple-minded person in the, in the movie, and he just... He stumbles here, he's in the White House with Kennedy, and he's, you know, I mean, he survives the Vietnam War, and the next thing you know, he's here when this happens, and, and that's the way my dad and uncles were. No, no plan. It just, you know, my dad's at a roller rink. My dad was quite a roller skater and ice skater. Wow. Big Midwest deal. Yeah. Okay. And my dad was very athletic. He was, the, you know, the uh, lifeguard at the, the city pool. And he was, uh, did uh, human dynamics, you know, where you do the three guys and the handstands oh, on yeah. top of each other yeah. and all that. And there's some pictures in the book when he was overseas and all. My dad was a really super athletic guy. And uh, so uh, they, he, he's at this roller rink and he meets this guy who happens to be the male secretary for Joel Thorne and uh, my dad gets to talking to him and my dad never had a problem making friends with anybody <laughs> I mean we'd be in the line to get a hamburger at, in, in and out and literally a guy said to me one day he goes we I he says I promise you I've, I've been around your dad enough and he knew you know obviously I grew up around my dad I knew him very well he says I'll make you a bet. Your dad will know the two people ahead of us in line and the two people behind us in line before we ever order our hamburger. And I said, I'm not taking that bet. I said, <laughs> because you're right, right. And, and ultimately, that's what happened. But anyway, so he met this guy and he bragged up about my uncle. And that's how my uncle got the job at Joel Thorne's, which just, I mean, that in itself was just amazing because Joel Thorne, you know, ran Indy and there's that great story that he was under 21 and wanted to run in the race. And at that time you had to be 21, you know, no women in the garage area, Correct. you know, yeah. and, you know, he had to wear whites and, you know, all the, all these early rules when racing was a heck of a lot more structured in a lot of ways. And, uh, he, uh, they wouldn't let him run. And so Joel started buying entries. Hey, you want to sell me your team? And, and he had, told the speedway in effect and this is pre tony holman if you don't let me run i'll buy the whole field and i'll stop the race <laughs> and uh, which is a great movie wow. plot you yeah. know what i mean and they let him run wow and uh so the, you know he had inherited a lot of I was money i ask you that where was yeah. that money coming from well his dad got killed and and uh, recently thanks to the internet 
uh, I had posted something and a guy corrected me in a very nice way, which I'm always, you know, in favor of making sure the history is a lot more accurate. And because, you know, a lot of that, Joel, I got gotten secondhand and the guy said, no, no, if you do research in the New York Times, go online, you'll find out that it's this, this and this. And I go, thank you very much. So I paid to go on the New York Times and go back through all the articles. And I found out that Joel's dad, I knew he had died young and Joel had inherited this massive fortune. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars wow. at about 12 years of age. And this is like the 19-teens? Yeah, it, it, this would be, I think, the 30s. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so he, his dad was changing a tire, as I remember, by the side of the road and got hit by a car and killed. Wow. And he was in the process of getting a divorce uh, from not Joel's mom, but another you know, wife. And she made a play to try and say that she would inherit the deal, and th that did that went nowhere. And that's why, uh, partially, why the New York Times covered this so much, is Joel's dad. He, where did he get his money? Well, Pullman rail cars, okay. uh, banking. I mean, wow. the family was real deal East Coast old school money. Yeah. And uh, so Joel becomes the heir to this after the the soon to be in the process of ex-wife played out her deal and lost and uh he didn't have any real good adult supervision and you know i mean that's just an absolute <laughs> formula for disaster yeah. i mean you know <laughs> you know I, 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 any of us you're just not going to grow up and have responsibility and and uh all these things it just doesn't come by uh walking out in the air you know, you have to have somebody drill it into your head. Yeah, yeah. And, and learn some and, hard lessons along the way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like my dad did with me, your dad did with you, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, that's part of the tough job of being a parent is not being your child's friend, uh, best friend. But, you know, but you're looking down the road. So anyway, yeah, Joel was... Uh, is unbelievable and and he had really the money to have some of the best talent Clyde Adams you know and you I know you know Clyde Adams there's a lot of cars he was a real great fabricator Legion Ascot cars etc from the 30s and that yes. uh, God uh, Russ and Red Garnet they were pattern makers uh, uh, Frank Curtis worked there for a while Art Sparks was Art Sparks was the shop foreman shop manager wow. and uh you know the sparks big six motor uh and art well his book uh years ago if you can find one you're going to pay a lot of money they're out of print and it's you know ex very expensive book on the secondary market now but but art had cut a deal with joel at joel's insistence for a lifetime contract for so much a week or month or whatever it yeah. was and it wasn't long after that original deal that that uh, Art realized, hey, wait a minute, I'm a fool. <laughs> I, I I just sold my soul, and and he finally broke the deal and got out of it. Wow. And so one of the guys that came after that was a guy by the name of Frank Curtis, and Frank had been renting a space in the loft at Thorne's shop, and that's how my uncle met Frank. Okay. Yeah. And and. My Uncle Zeke was everybody's friend. I mean, I grew up everywhere we'd go, hey, where's Zeke? We, he was, people say, he's happy-go-lucky. He was the racer's racer. You know what I mean? He, yeah. he loved mechanics. Uh, you'd, you'd instantly like the guy if you <laughs> met him because he was all about the mechanics. I mean, you know, he died at... Uh, what, 81, and six months before he died, he was laying under a car uh, in 80-degree weather, and he's battling cancer. And, wow. uh, I mean, he was, a, he was a lifelong mechanic, loved mechanics, uh, and towards the end of his life, he loved to prove that a lot of stuff that was thrown away could actually still be used, and he'd build stuff out of total junk. <laughs> and we'd go, Zeke, look, we can afford to buy good parts now, Okay. And he'd go, no, but I just want to, I want to prove to people that you don't, you know, this is still good. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, but yeah, no, he, uh, that's how he met Frank. And then of course, after the war, that's 
how they reconnected and my uncle became Frank Curtis's first employee. But it, it should be mentioned here that the the racing scene and especially the midget scene in Southern California at this time was like Major League Baseball and NFL today. Oh, it yeah. Was, it was massive. Uh, I know, I mean, we sit here in Indianapolis, and Indianapolis is, you know, they call it the racing capital of the world. Uh, and the Midwest is is thick with open wheel racing now. But in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that era, midget racing in California was every night of the week. I mean, all the movie stars went. This was the thing to do, and everyone was doing it. It's all true, you know, and and it and it's uh, that is morphed from what you're talking about, what California was to what now Indy, and like this area that we're in, Brownsburg, et cetera, uh, has morphed into for a lot of reasons, partially political, yeah. uh, and and also geographical. Mm-hmm. Uh, but California, that era. Uh, you know, there's that, uh, the Peterson had a great uh, exhibit a number of years back that uh, like 90% of the field were built in a 12 mile radius in Los Angeles area. Yeah. Yeah. And he had all the guys out there, Wayne Ewing, Luigi Lasowski. Uh, AJ Watson. Yeah, AJ Watson. Yeah. yeah. Indianapolis yeah. claims him. But yeah. He oh, no, 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 no. Watson's <laughs> building on Palmer Avenue still is there. Uh, and we sponsored Watson in the sixties and, and I knew AJ from a very young age and, you know, he'd worked at Curtis for a while and, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, it was all right there. And after the war, Chris Economaki, national speed sport news really put it into perspective on midget auto racing. Cause it's hard for a lot of people to realize this today. Uh, except for the Midwest, East Coast, because the West Coast, we just don't have that much, again, for, and we could go on into the reasons, yeah. but whatever. Yeah. But it just didn't happen in California anymore. And uh, it, it was the number one form of racing after World War II, midgets. And, you know, pre-war were all the frame rail cars, uh, meaning for the people who may not know, they were car frames. Uh, that you go to the wrecking yard. I mean, you know, today you go on the internet, you buy parts, and prior to that, you had a speed shop, and, and or you had a catalog like uh, J.C. Whitney or Honest Charlie or somebody like that. And, but going way back, it was the wrecking yard, and uh, you knew what steering box was the good steering box, and you knew what frame was the right yeah. frame, you knew what suspension was it, and and it's and I to people today I tell them you know it's the same thing these guys do with these Hondas where they take the lower end of the one model and the top end off the other model and they build these Franken motors it, it's really the same thing it is it yeah is. you know even though it's import and a lot of guys say of a certain age and up they don't quite get it it's only because they've never taken the time or it's never been explained to them okay yeah. it's hot it, rotting it's, it, it's, it's hot is rotting it's way. totally the same thing <laughs> it's totally the same thing it just happens to be that japanese cars are more prevalent yeah and uh and they're also small and more the, affordable and you yeah exactly young kids. affordability is a big issue That's for young drivers today the big issue yeah. in fact it's a very uh hampering issue but so chris said look uh you know, after the war, when the Curtis Midget was made, and it was the first of the tube frame midgets, and my uncle was there when they developed that, uh, and then the uh, Earl Gilmore paid uh, Fred Offenhauser to develop the 110 cubic inch offy motor for midgets because everything prior to that 110 cubic inch offy was pretty much like a junk formula, you might say. They were not dependable V860s, you know, the small Ford that nobody wanted other than for racing. Yeah. Uh, A lot of cars would drop out. Elto outboard motors. Yeah. Yeah. It it was, and Gilmore had this, you know, show place of a racetrack and he wanted more dependable racing. So he wrote the check. uh, It's in the D's book, the Mark D's uh, Miller book, uh, that this was covered very well by Mark, who I knew. uh, And, uh, he, he wrote the check, and Leo Goosen drew it up, who was the great designer, engine designer. And, uh, wow, there's the 110. See, if you had a Curtis Midget and the 110 cubic inch Offy, that 
that was like it. And that's what you needed to win races. Yeah. But the problem was then everybody bought one and everybody had the same car. So it became sort of like what we've got today in a lot of series. <laughs> yeah. And it's a spec deal. And, uh, and it became a follow the leader type thing. So ultimately what made midget auto racing grow is what sort of made it sort of decline. And, That's interesting. And, and Chris Economaki said, you know, midgets brought racing into the small towns where racing had been outside of the town on a big track. Midgets could run at the, the uh, high school track, et cetera, et cetera. So it exposed auto racing to people who never probably would have gone. And that's what caused this great explosion. Because if you look now, no discredit to the people pre-World War II. And, you know, people might hear this term pre-war. It's, it's always acknowledging World War II. Because historically, that's a major dividing line in technology. It's, it's you know, and I know, Josh... You've lived in the world of all pre-war stuff a lot. You know that very well. And, and thankfully, guys like you help preserve that. But after the war is when racing, as we know it today, was developed. Wally Parks organized drag racing. Yeah. It was disorganized prior to NHRA. Uh, Tony Holman brought Indy Speedway really into its golden era. Yes. Bill France organized stock car racing. Uh, it was disorganized prior to Bill France, uh, you know, and any of these guys love them or hate them uh, for any number of reasons. They created something that was really great. And sports car racing really post World War Two is when it really came into its own okay. and started to be get a little bit more. It, it still was a rich guy sportsman racing. I don't want any decals on my car, et cetera. Yeah. And it was for the, you know, the, the uh, gentrified set. Yeah. And uh, until Roger Ward showed up at Lime Rock with that midget and, and blew the doors off. And they, they right. go, there, who's, this, who's this hayseed from the Midwest? You know, I mean, and, and taught him a thing or two. But so after World War II is, you know, TV dinners, freeways, track housing. I mean, there's so much that happened after World War II that, that we still are affected by today uh, modernization so anyway it was it was amazing what midget auto racing really the influence it had i mean I, as you saw at our museum out there our collection in in duarte i mean i've got a giant blow up of road and track magazine 1948 got midgets on the cover <laughs> road and track okay now i i was the radio voice of road and track for 10 years and i can tell you if any of the editors, if I ever said to them, hey, you know, they had midgets on the magazine back, you know, in the 40s, they'd like, hey, yeah, right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, no. You, whether it's built by Ferrari? No, uh, no, no, no. Nope. We're talking American racing here, yeah. guys, you know. So, yeah, it, you know, interesting history. The, that's going to take me to the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, not only did racing in, explode after World War II, but what also happened was a lot of the guys, the soldiers that went to World War II, they saw technology in the war being used. And typical racers, they said, ooh, I can use that on a race car. And after World War II, we see the use of magnesium. Um, all kinds of technologies came home from the war. And one of them that I really want to talk about that racers today will understand is the Zeus fasteners use on race cars. To understand it, that was your dad? Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, uh, war is a terrible thing. Uh, you know, just to make a what I think is a really important historical fact that most people don't know is how many people died globally in World War II. And, you know, they don't know for sure. But there are estimates out there. And according to the research I've done, the best estimate is about 56 million people. Jeez. Globally. Yeah. And I might add, it was more civilians died than soldiers. It was yeah. much safer to be a soldier, as crazy as that sounds. If you read the history books, yeah. that's what you'll see. You know, because a lot of civilians got killed in bombings and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so war is a terrible thing, okay? But the positive, if you can look at it that way, is exactly what you said. There's so much money that was spent in order to win the battle and increase technology. And so my dad had become familiar with the Zeus fastener, obviously pre-war. Yes. 
And, and people uh, don't re- might not realize how far back oh, Zeus Fastener goes. Yeah, no, I, I've seen an advertisement from the teens yeah. using Zeus Fastener. Oh, yeah. They go oh, way no. back. Yeah, <laughs> uh, D-Z-U-S, Zeus. Uh, and I met the uh, grandson of the inventor uh, just recently at the uh, International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, and he was as, as excited to meet me as I was <laughs> to meet him. It was really sort of neat. Because he said, I've, I've known this story forever about your family using our fasteners. And, and he had a cute story. There was a famous, and, and I'll get back to my dad and all this, but there was a famous uh, starter in NHRA in the early days by the name of Buster Couch. And okay. the guy was an icon. And he's in all the background, all the pictures. When I was out there shooting pictures for the magazines and all that, Buster's in my back, my pictures. He's in all my buddies that were photographers out there, pictures, etc. He was a great guy. And so when they finally started using Zeus fasteners in drag racing, Buster was like a lot of a lot of us in racing. He was a joker just as much as he was a good guy, you know. And it, not against poking somebody, you know, and and needling them, as they say. And so he would uh, always after you know X number of rounds of racing, he'd come find Ted Zeus, the grandson, and and he'd have a handful. Buster would a handful of Zeus fasteners. And he said, hey, these are falling off the cars at the starting line. And he did this <laughs> repeatedly, repeatedly, just, just riding the guy. And finally, Ted Zeus found out that Buster would go around the pit area and ask the crews, hey, you got any extra Zeus fasteners? You know, give me some. And he, he, he propagated this myth that, that, you know, they were falling off the cars, <laughs> which they weren't. Yeah. But anyway, so my dad had had experience with Zeus fasteners prior to the war. But when he went into the 8th Air Force and went to, to Europe for about four years, uh, and he was in, uh, he was repairing planes and he was flying planes. And because, you know, he was a, a valued asset you know when you uh join the military you're no longer a human being you are an asset of the u.s government and uh you're no different than the uh, desk chair or whatever i mean you know you're a tool to win this battle and uh so he flew a lot of b-17s uh like they they'd go over to the continent you know uh germany france etc etc you know uh holland Mm -hmm. uh and the bomber squadron would maybe land back in Holland or whatever, or they'd land back in, in England, in southern England, and uh, they came back and flak blew a hole in the side of the B-17 or whatever. Jeez, yeah. And uh, my dad and, and the group, they'd go down, they'd pick up the uh, plane because he was in the 310th Ferry Squadron, meaning they were, they'd were ferry planes. Okay. And he, he said we were the janitors of the Air Force. Uh, and, uh, so he said, we'd pick up the plane and literally fly it with a hole in the Just fuselage. Get it good enough to fly. And yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know what? If, the if technology, back, the, the planes fly. were a lot more resilient yeah. for different reasons than today. Yeah. Today, if you have a little cut on the leading edge because of the speeds and all that, it's eh, not going to work so good. But you know, back then it was different. And he said, we'd fly those back up into Northern England at one of the two bases that he was at, Wharton or Burtonwood. Uh, and Wharton was a, a base that was created out in the middle of the Northern British countryside, 10,000 GIs. Now, if you ever go to England, these villages are not 10,000 people. Now, 10,000 people in, in America is a small town. Yeah. Unless you live in parts of the Midwest where maybe 1,500, you know, or 2,000 or whatever, but 10,000 is considered to be a small town. Well, this is a base. I mean, this is, I mean, you talk about unbelievable. So they'd fly it back. So he had had a lot of experience with how resilient these fasteners worked on holding the skin on a, on a plane. And so when he had uh, finally gone to work for Curtis Craft after my uncle, who again was their first man on board, uh, one day Frank was out of town and they had Bullet Joe Garson's car in that was owned by Rex Mays. Okay. The Bose Seal Fast car. Uh, and there's a mo- little model of it that's been made. I've got one. I saw one at Dick Jordan's house yesterday. And uh, my dad said, Zeke, they were using nut plates. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which are inefficient, <laughs> slow to take the body work off. Yeah. Okay. 
And if you can Google nut plate and you'll find some details on it if you want to learn more about what it looks like if you're into the technical <laughs> side. And, and uh, my dad said to Zeke, Zeke, we should replace all these nut plates with Zeus fasteners, the, the spring and the nuts. And, and he said, it would be so much more efficient to pull this body work off these things when you need to do repairs. And Zeke said, yeah, but would they work at a hundred and some miles an hour? And my, my dad said, Zeke, I flew planes with holes in them in the war. And he said, N- that was never the reason why the plane had a problem. Yeah, okay. Indeed. There were a lot of other things like, like fog in England. Okay. That yeah. would kill a lot of guys. And, uh, so they went, to the surplus, and again, the surplus is where all your belly tanks came from. Yes. I mean, you know, all of a sudden when you stop the war machine. That's another effect. You, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you're manufacturing. You didn't go, hey, you know, I think we're going to wrap this thing up in about a month. Guys, uh, don't don't be producing all that stuff now. No, you're not. It's not the way it works in a war, okay? Yeah. It's full speed ahead. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of airplanes, brand new airplanes that were destroyed out in the desert, uh, you know, the God, they think how much they'd be worth today. But anyway, so so anyway, they went down the surplus, bought a bag of, of springs, of clips, and uh, and nuts, and changed over Joe Garson's uh, midget without the approval of Frank Curtis or the knowledge. He was out of town. Wasn't yeah, he? <laughs> not really the type of thing that you do when you work for somebody. But my dad and uh, and uncle. And it wasn't one of those, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. They weren't that smart. They just had youthful exuberance. And, uh, you know, they thought they were going to really get the kudos when Frank comes back. Hey, God, you got, you know, Good that's job, why boys. I hired you guys. <laughs> you know, job, that's boys. why I hired you. Because <laughs> you guys, you know, you're so good. You make me look good. Uh, it didn't go like that. So Frank comes back. He's not happy. Hey, you know what? This is my shop normal right yeah i mean i i knew frank he was a great man he was a super nice guy very mild mannered very tall giant of a man and like a lot of those really tall guys just it's a gentle giant as they say and but this didn't go as as much as i like you zeke and as much as i like you ed and as zeke you and i go out drinking and we go out and you know uh looking for uh, somebody to date or whatever Okay, you crossed the line now. This is, this is my is. shop. Yeah. And and the other thing that, that Frank was very smart, and you know this as, uh, as a fabricator, Frank was not highly educated, but he had figured out that he could make more money selling production cars than repairing cars, okay? He didn't want to do any repairs. He didn't want to do any retrofits because that's what you charge by the hour. And, you know, a lot of people just don't realize how much time goes into fixing things. Uh, oops, excuse me there. Uh, fixing things. And uh, they go, yeah, right. It took you five hours to fabricate that that uh, hinge. Yeah, yeah, actually six. But yeah. I'm only charging yeah, I'm you trying, for five. That's exactly, right. you're, you're exactly right. Right. No, Joey it's, Kerr it's, and I talk about that right it's, now. It's the yeah. lament of the fabricator. We okay? spend hours at night researching. Yeah, I, and in today's <laughs> world with the computer, it's just that much worse. Uh, worse they go you don't hit that button I, I, I go where is this button that everybody says you just hit you know what yeah. i mean you just hit the button don't you and, no. and it's like photoshop you know photoshop you can do miracles on but like i say in order to get to that level any child of three can do those things with 30 years experience okay and so you know you got to get paid for that 30 years experience or the 10 years or the 15 years or the 20 years. You know, how many times have you done it wrong before you finally learned how to do it right? Yes. And you, you deserve to get paid for that. So There's anyway, value to that. Exactly. Frank had figured that out. Frank had figured that out. He wanted to sell complete cars or kits. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's what opened up the opportunity for my dad and uncle and a lot of other guys to have their own place. But once he cooled down and he saw and he looked at them and he's, you know, when they obviously were gone and he went out there and he goes, well, let's look at what these crazy guys did. All the cars in from then on had Zeus fasteners on them. And that, that was the first application of the Zeus fastener on a race car. And, and That's you know, amazing. it just, it went globally. I mean, Grand Prix cars, you know, yeah. around the world. And, and, you know, as Ted Zeus told me the other day, 
we've made a lot of money because of your dad, <laughs> dad yeah. and uncle. And I said, well, you know what? It's it's a it was an awesome and the Zeus fastener is a really really great invention. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it doesn't vibrate. Uh, you know what? My dad and, and Uncle Zeke built the four Drake powered uh, Curtis midgets. Uh, they were built from Curtis kits in in the Justice Brothers shop, and one of them was for Bill Vukovic uh, Senior, yeah. you know, legend of the Speedway. And the problem, the Drake, for those who don't know, is a Harley V twin with Dale Drake water cooled designed heads. And but like any Harley, uh, particularly the older you go back, the thing vibrated like crazy. Okay, and they they used to have to put a uh, little extra ring on the uh, aluminum work because they otherwise the Zeus fastener it would auger out the aluminum wow you know because yeah. the vibration yeah. and and uh but even with all that vibration okay the problem wasn't the Zeus fastener coming loose wow. you know as you know that quarter turn yeah and you know that's Ted's mis- uh, nickname Mr. Quarter Turn really yeah that's cool. yeah that's cool. yeah and you know that quarter <laughs> turn and it bing yeah. it it locks we're racing the little 500 tonight, and our car, every car in the field tonight, is going to have Zeus fasteners from end to end. Yeah. It's and it's never been a factor, never been a factor that the uh, loose Zeus fact fastener is on the track that uh, gets picked up by a tire and pitched into the face of a driver or anything. Nah, it just doesn't happen. It's not, not part no, of No, they're bulletproof. They you, are. You mentioned there that your dad and uncle started their own shop on the side, and that was due, they were basically, like you said, Frank didn't want to repair cars. But your dad and your uncle started their own shop doing just that, basically fabricating race cars, repairing race cars. And and again, this is the era when we're racing almost every night of the week. It's just it had been so hectic and busy. Yeah, and, and, and it was uh, it was an era where, you know, when fiberglass came and it changed a lot. And of course, they were long out of fabrication by that point. Uh, they had figured out that the midget thing was probably going to peak and then going to roll down and. And my dad really was the guy that saw that. And, uh, you know, fi- when fiberglass came in, it was just replace. Yeah. And, but when it was all hand-formed aluminum and you crunched the car, you, you know, you had to either straighten that body work out. Or, and, like, you know, when they, went, when they went down to Florida, when we moved to Florida where I was born, and one of the ways that they made their name in selling uh, the oil additive was they'd, they'd go down the street and they'd see a race car sitting in front of the uh, service station. Because back in the day, a lot of guys who ran race cars owned service stations. Yes, yeah, it went hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, Jack McAfee, well known to be a sports car driver. Rex's son is a good friend of mine, and he was named after Rex Mays. Wow. And uh, he, Jack had a service station originally before, before he became a Porsche dealer and had a sprint car. And, uh, and so anyway, they'd see a car and, and if the car had uh, bodywork damage to it, that was all the better. Yeah. And there's one story my, that I'd heard many times growing up that they, they roll in there and they introduce themselves to this guy. And of course this guy, you know, uh, you know, when they, when they were from the Midwest, they went to California, they had a Midwestern accent. They were, they go, hey, 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 seed, you know, it's like, hey, farm boy, you know, what's up with you, you know? And, okay, well, you know, it's like, hey, come on, really, you know? And so then they, when they moved from California to Florida, they had, now they were from California and down in Florida, then they were said, hey, West Coast slick boy, uh, you know, you're out there from the West Coast, think you're going to show us how to do it down? Yeah, okay. So then when we moved back from Florida to California and they had picked up a Southern accent because, you needed to assimilate, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And don't talk so fast, you know, and, and get into the culture of the area. And now they come back to California. Now you're from down south. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable. There's always, they've always been from somewhere else. And my accent is some combination <laughs> of all of that. So so anyway, they, they see this car and it's got a crunch tail on it. And they, they make friends with the guy. And my dad had a book of uh, 8 by 10 photographs. Uh, from a lot of the work they had done at Curtis Craft. Yeah. And that was his, like, a portfolio resume. Yeah. Okay. 
and uh, they'd start flipping through the book and talking and don't let the guy interrupt you and just keep going on, going on the pitch. And, mm-hmm. and they say, hey, we, if, if we fix that tail on your car, will you handle our products? Would you, would you buy an order and, and uh, carry our products? And the guy goes, yeah, okay, I'm up for that. And so Zeke, they'd take the tail off, aluminum, yeah. take a cross-cut saw and saw the tail right down the center. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Now you can imagine. Two halves, yeah, so two, two, halves. two halves, right. Just like you clamshell it. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and you can imagine, though, a guy who bought the car, who never saw how it was built, <laughs> it's like, okay, so what did I do here? <laughs> uh, these two guys come in. I've never met them before. They got this book of pictures. They say they can do all this, and the guy now is cutting my tail in half. Yeah. It, it started with some dents in it. Okay, now I got... <laughs> now it's in two pieces. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least with the dents, I had a tail. Now... But then that you know, then Zeke would hammer it out, and uh, and you know when wow. the when the guy would see this quote magic happen, and then he'd have to you know aluminum weld it back, yeah. and you know aluminum welding is is on body works an art, not everybody can do it, yeah. and then he'd let it in, and then fix and file, and and wow. you know fix it all up, pretty soon, you know he, a friend would say, hey where you got your car fixed? Yeah, how'd you? Oh, you, you got to meet these guys. Yeah, these well, guys. the word traveled. And and that's how, because when they went down south, my dad and, and Uncle Zeke said, then they started working with the pre-NASCAR stock car guys. He said, look, they were, they were so uh, not educated in uh, the higher level of fabrication. Right. And it, this is not meant in a negative way. They just never just, had the opportunity. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, it wasn't how they were doing it. No. And, and he said, look, when we went down there, on most of those old stock cars, they'd use one length bolt. Well, one length. <laughs> and if it was a little bit too long, put more washers on it. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he said, you know, we came from, uh, my dad, of course, being an aircraft mechanic. You know, an aircraft, it's not like, hey, okay, that's close. It's good. No. Oh, no. It's as precision as anything you're ever going to get. Yes. It's like... Uh, Maybe the space program is even that much a little bit higher, mm-hmm. okay? As we found out, very small things on the shuttle can result in very big problems. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, Curtis was made up of a lot of the guys, as you sort of alluded to, coming out of the war, who had been trained in by the U.S. government at our government expense in the right way to do mechanics. When my dad worked at Douglas Aircraft, he told me, Every tool had a place in your toolbox, and they'd pull a toolbox check, and if all your tools, number one, weren't accounted for, and they weren't in the right position, you got dinged on your paycheck, wow. and, and or you could get terminated. Yeah. Uh, because what, what happened to that, uh, that wrench? Well, I, God, I don't know what happened to that wrench. Well, you know, it's in a, a engine to sell yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, this could you be know. catastrophic. Yeah, exactly. So... They go. They come from the West Coast down south, and Zeke had, was not an aircraft mechanic, but he had been trained by all these guys, Emil Deet, who was a famous bodybuilder, and uh, they became heroes of the guys down south when they they showed them, you know, the refinement because they were look at they wanted to learn. They just didn't have access to it, yeah. and so when these guys came from, you know, the greatest race car, car shop at that time and really one of the greatest in the history of race cars curtis craft uh statistically etc these guys were like wow uh please help yeah. us anyway yeah. so yeah. it'd be like someone from mclaren coming. yeah like, yeah, yeah yes, exactly tell, teach me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and you just mentioned now they're in florida and they've got an oil additive business and we know that is the justice brothers oil additives yeah later yeah to, yeah explain that how that came about because well that's a huge part of the story yeah they they uh you know they my uncle zeke had run into this uh, uh another brand uh and uh the brand was unknown it was being made by a 76 year old gentleman uh it was only one one product in the line now is this an additive for oil more, additive is this for more or less friction or a little more longer lasting what it what was yeah well, both additive? both okay. yeah yeah and so Just everything that racers wanted yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and uh you know i mean back in that era it was uh people would say oh yeah, it's the snake oil goose <laughs> grease mouse milk you know that type of stuff but my uncle zeke had met this 76 year old gentleman 
who was a retired attorney, and uh, this is the short version. And uh, again, the product was unknown, and uh, he he told my dad, "Hey, I want you to see something." And uh, he said, I, "I want you to see this." Well, my dad saw it, and again, with this idea that maybe this midget thing wasn't going to last because they were they were building cars as fast as they could. I mean, it, you know the the number of Curtis midgets is you know, 500, 500 plus, wow. whatever, you know what I mean? There's that famous picture in yeah. the shop and yeah, all yeah. the midgets are lined up. Yeah, I mean, they were they were popping them out. Wow. And I mean, people couldn't get them fast enough. And again, the GIs coming home, everybody was looking for a good time. They had had, they, a lot of the GIs had money because you got paid while you were in the war. Yeah. But generally, most of the guys sent the money home. And, uh, and you know, it's like people go, well, you know, that, that racing right after the war, that was dangerous. And I go, you know, you really need to put this into context because a lot of these guys came home and they left uh, a lot of their friends either on the beaches or in the fields or they augured in in a bomber or whatever. And I go, really, was racing really that dangerous compared to what they had just experienced? Yeah. And they go, this is nothing. No one's and, shooting at them. No, nah, one's I mean this, and, and it's all it's all relative, I guess, you know. So, so anyway, uh, my dad, when he saw it, uh, he agreed with Zeke. Yeah, let's do this. So they bought they 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 had their own race car that they had built, midget, and uh, they ran it one time at Gilmore, with a driver by the name of D. W. McCauley, and they sold the car, made twenty five hundred dollars profit. And they took that and what little savings they had and plowed it all into this product, buying it from a 76-year-old man in 1940s. Now, 76 in the 1940s is like 100 in today's (laughs) world, okay? Because there was no open-heart surgery. There was no, hey, why don't you take one of those, uh, you know, nitro pills or, you know, like Shelby lived on for years or whatever. I mean, it's like... This might be our first purchase from the guy, and then again, it might be our last purchase from the guy because he might be dead next week. You yeah, know, yeah. seriously. Yeah, that's how, exactly. And and so uh, they wanted to stay in California, but this fellow's next door neighbor, uh, a guy by the name of Bill Klesik, who was a very nice man, who I I got to know real well years uh, over the years, uh, he had helped this older gentleman, and the older gentleman felt it was only right that he offer his next door neighbor, this young Navy, uh, member of the Navy, if you want to sell my product, you have California, which unfortunately he said yes. So that meant my dad said, okay, well, the closest thing to California is Florida, which even Floridians, of which again, I was born in Florida, even Floridians will tell you, Florida is not California. Okay, come on. I mean, it's sunny and we have palm trees, but it's, they're two different places. Okay. Uh, California doesn't have alligators. They don't have swamp land. You know, everywhere you dig a foot down in Florida, you find water. Yeah. California, we can't find water if we go looking for it, okay? <laughs> exactly. Although we got plenty right now. But anyway, so, so uh, they sold the car, took all that. And as you saw the pictures in the book, Josh, I mean, they, and, and uh, Simon uh, Hodgson, who's the, uh, one of the competition tech guys at IMSA, uh, got the book and he told me he's from England and he said it's just an amazing story I mean they're like ragtag bunch going across the country <laughs> and with nothing but a dream and this product nobody heard of and he's and he says your mom is six months pregnant and I said that's right wow. and I said and they don't have a home they'd never been to Florida they looked at it on a map Imagine that today. If your dad came over and said, "Hey, I got this weird oh my it, oil, look at it. If and I, we're going to move to the other end of the country, and this is what we're going to do." Yeah, right and now. we don't have a home, <laughs> honey. You're going to have a no child. Plan, you're going to no. have our first child in three months. Jeez. Everything will be fine. No, I, I always tell people. I said, "Look, my mom at minimum was what you would have to say was a good sport." Okay, yeah. and, and I'm saying that somewhat tongue in cheek. <laughs> I mean, she she married my dad, and totally for better or for worse okay this was clearly probably maybe part of the worst part okay (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) this wasn't the better part this isn't what i really pictured marriage was going to be like you know 
going to the other end of the U.S. and we'll find a home when we get there, have no friends, I'll find a new doctor. Uh, you know, if you've ever been through the child thing, you know, uh, there's a nesting sort of, and you get the nursery ready and all. Hey, there was none of that, wow. okay? So, and my dad used to say, you know, Ed, people used to say I was a high pressure salesman. And uh, he said, if having to put food on the table for my family and survive made me high pressure, then I was. And uh, he said, there was no option for failure. And I said, and I asked him one time, I said, did you guys ever consider if things didn't go right, you go on unemployment? And he said, never was a consideration, Ed. That's and, cool. and my dad was an honest that's guy. He, he, that's honorable, too. Though. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. He, he said, look, Ed, back in those days, it was called going on the dole, okay? And he said, it was just, he said, look, Zeke and I were blessed with good health. And, and, and I might add that my uncle Gus, who was the paraplegic, was always part of the plan. They always took care of him. And he was the finance guy, and he did his share, but... But being in a wheelchair, particularly in that era, okay, yeah. <clears throat> it's not like it is today, Correct. okay, uh, and they were called crippled back mm -hmm. then. I mean, there's there's there one newspaper clipping in the book uh, that you look at of my dad and my uncle Gus at the Indy Speedway. It was running the I think the Indianapolis Star in 1950 something, and they said Ed Justice and his crippled brother Gus Justice. Yeah. I mean, that was the term. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was no disability. There was none of all this stuff that we take for granted today. Uh, and so they always took care of my Uncle Gus. So there was my dad and Zeke were responsible for three families, okay? And my Uncle Zeke at that time was not married, so a little bit less expense for him. My Uncle Gus was married, but they didn't have kids. And so my dad with a new family, uh, you know, they made it happen. And, and literally a year after they started selling the product, the, the, believe it or not, the plant burns down, oh, geez. And, uh, which wasn't much of a plant, to be quite honest. But it burnt down where they made the product. And they couldn't get product for two months. Oh, so man. what did they do? They went back to what they knew, and they went around. They started doing body work, pickup jobs. Yeah. Uh, just again, and it's, he said, we just did whatever we had to until we were able to get product again. Wow. So, you know, I mean, one thing about our book, uh, uh, Josh, that I think you've seen, it's a racing book and there's amazing racing history in there, but it's also a business book and it's a dream book. And I, I hope that a lot of people, that that's what they get out of the story when they read the book. And I think it's the best $90 they can spend, that they, they see guys that started with nothing our family and were blessed with just the basics but they had a, a desire to work and a willingness to work and they were able to achieve the american dream and through a lot of setbacks mm -hmm. a lot of setbacks i mean everything in the book is not all about success there's there's a and i wouldn't say there was failure Although some might say that There's it was lessons. more setbacks, yeah, lessons, you know. yeah. It it, it was. A, there, look at we've been through our share of rough times, but uh, the deal is, you know, Richard Nixon says you never know how sweet the or maybe it was Teddy Roosevelt or Nixon, one of the two. You never know how how sweet the heights of the peaks are unless you've been in the depths of the valley. That is so true. Yeah, it is true. Yeah. And, and when everything's going along great, you really don't know what you have till you lose it. And then once you lose it, then you realize the next time you get it back, okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, and, and it, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, <laughs> as they say. But there's, there's truth to that. I wow. mean, it, it's what, you know, it's what builds character. At, you, you're either going to sink or swim. Yeah. At the time they're doing this and this is Florida. And basically, like you said, it was kind of a territories for the product. What was the product called at first there? When it, it was Winds Friction Proofing okay. Oil, which was a very, very uh, convoluted that. name. Okay. Because they'd go in and they go, hey, I'm selling Winds Friction Proofing Oil. And they go, uh, roofing oil? <laughs> I don't need, or what do you, uh, and they go, no, 
friction proofing oil. Yeah. Well, what's that? Well, and of course, the car is sitting over here in the Speedway Museum. That was when we won Indy in nineteen fifty. Yeah. yeah. Everyone yeah. in and a lot of the people that listen to this are vintage guys, and we've seen that wins friction proof decal on all the Indy cars over the years, and and the yellow winning car that has it on the nose and silver leaf. Um, how did they go from a couple guys down in Florida to sponsoring? most of the field of Indy. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, here here again. And obviously it was a uh, my product dad, that worked. <laughs> yeah, look at Chestine when was an older gentleman. He was a retired attorney. He had no presence in racing. He knew nobody. Uh, you know, good enough guy, but, you know, he had his limits, yeah. okay. And he, uh, come along to Justice Brothers, who are well-connected in the racing world. They land down in Florida. My Uncle Zeke had met Bill France, on the uh, Joel Thorne team, because my Uncle Zeke, the first trip to the, as a participant for the Justice Brothers was in 1946, the first race after the war, and my Uncle Zeke was on the winning crew of George uh, Robson. Yes. And uh, and uh, that was Joel Thorne's car, and Art Sparks was the guy, and, and Art used to come by years and years after he retired. He bought product. He would never allow my dad and my uncle to, to sell him, I mean, to give him product. <laughs> he always insisted. Art was old school, sort of like German, uh, you know, descendancy type deal, and guys I like. I mean, it, Art was just a great guy, and, uh, you know, he got tied in with the Porsche factory, the 917s. A lot about that guy people don't know, but anyway... Uh, so the Justice Brothers had all these connections. And because, uh, you know, I mean, again, they built a car for Bill Vukovic. And, you know, I mean, they knew them all. Yeah. And so uh, Frank Curtis uh, sent my uh, Uncle Zeke uh, a letter in 19, uh, December of 49, uh, which there's a uh, photograph of in the book. And I've got the original letter offering the Justice Brothers to sponsor his 1950 in, entry in the Indy 500, which happened to be the 1949 national champion. The car would be carrying the number one, Johnny Parsons. That's serious. Yeah the, yeah, the year before, the car ran as a plain red car, unsponsored. Wow. And so he offered them the deal for $5,000. They went to wins. They said, we're not interested in sponsoring a bunch of racing you know, whatever, you know, yeah, <laughs> all yeah. right. Wild guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever. That may, that's the best description. <laughs> okay. And uh, we don't sell our products to these guys. And, you know, racers were like motorcycle riders to a lot of people. We've were, talked about that a little bit yeah, on this podcast. Yeah, yeah looked down wasn't upon. Always oh, no. I mean, no, there, no, there no, were no. organizations trying to end auto racing. Oh, 1955 kind of... was a seminal year. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it could all ended in 1955. Yeah. AAA bailed. I mean, they... Yeah. they For a lot of reasons. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 1950, that's yeah, when they, USAC... It, it wasn't no reason. There no. was a lot going no, on. No, no, a lot of people died in 55, you mm -hmm. know, 80-plus at Le Mans being probably the biggest yes. and still the biggest wreck in racing history. But anyway, so... A lot so, of companies didn't want to be no, associated no, no, with No, no, no. Still today... That, that mentality still exists, wow. trust me. So anyway, uh, they, uh, they got no help from wins, and so they cobbled together five grand, which is a lot of money in 1950. Yeah. And Frank threw in the second team car gratis for free, wow. and that was Freddie Agabashian. Wow. And uh, they became Frank Curtis's first sponsor. And uh, this... Indy, Indy was the first race of the season in that era. Which coincidentally is why NASCAR's biggest race of the year is the first race of the year. And NASCAR very much patterned after what was the top of the mountain at that time, Correct. the Indianapolis 500, okay? Yeah. The sweepstakes. And, uh, and so um, they, they go there, they win, and it literally puts the brand on the map. And now understand they had already in 1948 and uh, 49 been working with Bill France and they became the first sponsors in NASCAR with the the wins decals and all that and plenty of photographic proof which is in the book and, and NASCAR acknowledges that uh, when my dad passed away a few years ago they very graciously he was one of of I think 17 people that they honored at the banquet uh, Paul Newman being another one of the uh, fellows they honored uh, and, uh, 
which I it, I was happily uh, amazed and and indebted to NASCAR for that gesture. You know that they the historians you know got it right and uh, anyway so. So uh, in, when they went Indy, and then they go down to, uh, you know, they'd already been, they won at Daytona, the first race, on the, nat, for the first NASCAR-sanctioned race on the beach. On the beach. Because they had been running on the beach prior to NASCAR, just for the record. Correct. But, but when Bill France said, look, guys, I'm going to organize this. I'm not going to be the promoter that's running away with the money. You're going to get your money and all that. And, yeah, which was huge. Right. It was, was big, 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 big. Yeah. And, and Bill France Sr., look at a visionary uh, yeah, you can hear a lot of interesting stories about the the man and Smokey Unix books. Uh, you know, have some of that and all that. And and look at I've I've heard all that stuff. And and but I want to tell you something. Uh, the auto racing and obviously stock car racing owes everything to the France family. Uh, I agree. Bill Senior, Bill Junior, Jim today. Uh, you know. I've had a lot of very well-known drivers who did not like the NASCAR back in the day tell me, look, it, they really got it right. It needs to be run by a dictatorship. You can't allow racers to regulate themselves. Uh, yes. it, yeah, and it's true because yeah. they, every racer is greedy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we all look from our own perspective and not in the big picture. And so NASCAR was a great thing. So, yeah, no, they won the first NASCAR sanctioned race on the beach with, with uh, Red Byron in Raymond Parks, you know, 39 standard coupe uh, built by Red Vogt. And my uncle Zeke dated Red Vogt's sister. And uh, so they knew all these guys. So in 50, they went Indy the, in May, and then they go down September. There's a brand new track in uh, Darlington, uh, South Carolina called Darlington. Yep. Okay. And they're going to have a first 500 mile NASCAR race ever in history of NASCAR. First race on pavement in NASCAR history, and it's going to be called the Southern 500. And uh, they're going to have a mo- mascot, Johnny Reb, and he had the Rebel flag. All this stuff that yeah. now is just, boy, you know, you get you on the changed. front page of the newspaper, you know. So anyway, they go down there, and they, they sponsor. They had 70-some-odd cars in the race, and it took like seven hours to run the race, give or take, you know, an hour tires or two. Tires were an issue. Yeah, big issue. Because cotton cord tires, before, before polyester and steel belted, it was cotton cord. And they were junk. Yeah. I mean, they were junk tires. And my dad told me, I mean, I heard this story many, many times, that uh, – they un- totally underestimated it. And Darlington was paved with using seashells and a lot of stuff. Very abrasive. Yeah, very abrasive. And it's unequal, and it's the lady and, and, in black, and, and you know, to too fair, tough to tame. Yeah. And, and, it, and, you know, the Darlington Stripe. Like yeah, tar- the Darlington Stripe, which is iconic now because they're rubbing up against the wall and all that. Wow. And so it was, it, it was a challenging track. And, uh, and nobody knew what they were getting into. And he said they literally were taking tires off passenger cars in the infield this is not uh, urban legend this is fact to put them on the race cars yeah, and leaving a out. note on the car <laughs> hey we'll take care of this okay so anyway uh, and the guy who won johnny mance we sponsored so I mean, picture this my dad and my uncles win the indy 500 the southern 500 my dad is 29 years of age Jeez. i mean yeah now wow. so no what do you do next? <laughs> well, I think I'll retire at 30. You know, I've pretty much done everything. You know? yeah. So anyway, John and Johnny won, as a lot of people might know listening to this. He won because he was running truck tires. He was the only guy that put truck tires on. Now, look, it, it'd be great to say they really had this figured out, but they didn't. But he never came in for a tire change, yeah. and he was not the fastest. This was the tortoise and the hare. Perfect. Yeah, and you know, look at it. Took a lot of years. It wasn't really till the Woods brother, uh, the Wood brothers, came to Indy, thanks to Dan Gurney, that people realized you can actually win the race in the pits. You know, yes. the old school mentality was, I got to pass that guy on the track. Well, as we know now, it's gone way too far the other way, where there's not for a lot of people enough passing on the track. And now I have people figuratively pass people in the pits. Yes. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And Pit strategy is oh, half the race. Oh, my God. Hard. That's yeah. why you get these very well-paid engineers. Yeah. Uh, and the, all the telemetry and everything. I mean, you know, it's like NASA. 
I mean, you know, the Formula One teams, what is it, Mercedes, they got telemetry from the track going back to England, the headquarters, and they're uh-huh. calling the shots. It's like it's like uh, our drone strike operation that's being run out of uh, out of Nevada. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, the headquarters it's high is, tech. Yeah. Crazy. It's amazing. It, it's And what you're saying there with the tires, some people might not realize that tires had never been abused like that before. No. On the highways, 55 mile an hour was flying at that time. You oh, know, big they, time. No one was running 80 and 90 like they do today. No. So that was the first time tires had really been tested like that on a super speedway, on pavement, at those speeds for that long. Well, and you didn't run high speeds back in the day because I, I grew up in this. Because, number one, we didn't have air conditioning in cars, okay? <laughs> and in certain regions, like even here in, in Indiana, in the summertime, it gets a little bit hot and sticky. <laughs> and so, you know, you do the old 260 air conditioner, two windows down at 60 miles an hour. You know, but, and when you, when you drive your car with the windows down, speed is totally different than today in these cocoons that we drive that are so quiet at a, hundred miles an hour or whatever and yeah. you just get numbed yeah you know what i mean yeah. and uh so yeah there was a lot of reasons why you didn't drive fast wow. you know because you realize how fast you were going yeah okay what after they've back to that indy 500 win one little tidbit you told me once that i liked uh that was the that car that won the 500 that was the first time we saw the legendary wings on the wins logo yeah my dad came up with that and uh, they, the, a, a mr win was yeah guy. mr win was not happy <laughs> actually the car the car the car in the museum the lettering on the side of the car is not right uh it's it's not it's it's only close in name uh <laughs> because the the name was actually in silver leaf too okay. and it's in black lettering and it also had special under it. Uh, and I can show you a picture of the way the car... I mean, I've got a picture of the guy lettering it in Curtis's shop, believe it or not. Wow. And uh, so I can show you the way the car was. And You know, I, I that type of stuff drives me crazy. It because it's so me, easily fixed. That's my job. You know what that's, I mean? That's what I do. It, yeah, it's so easily fixed. <laughs> I mean, look me at nuts. some cars, uh, particularly when it got later, when sponsorship became more popular and not the era we're talking about. But when sponsorship became more popular and you had, you know, multiple different decals on the cars and all that, and it might change from race to race. Uh, and so you just say, well, pick your race. And it, or if it was the biggest victory or whatever, and restore the car to that, because okay, you can't do it all. Correct. And uh, so, and that's good. I mean, so you say, okay, it's, this is the way the car was at that race. Now, that's good. But, you know, that type of stuff, I... Man, you know, like I, some of the vintage cars running at the track, some of them have plastic lettering on them. And, you know, I love plastic lettering, but not for that. No, okay. Exactly. Right. I, I mean, that you, and, and it's funny. When I did the tribute car to the first NASCAR champion, a 39 standard coupe, and, and I uh, had Tom Kelly, who was the Baron Roth and Kelly. Tom's a legend. Started out with his, uh, what was it, his uncle? And then Ed Roth, Big Daddy Roth, and all that. And Tom's still going strong. And he's a he's an artist. He's a perfectionist. He takes pride in his work. And when I told he and, and his buddy and my buddy, Bob Spina, I wanted this car to be lettered, make the paint thick so it shows brush strokes, so it doesn't flow. <laughs> yeah. And you know oh, better yeah. than me, because this is what you do, don't let it flow. I want brush strokes in it, and I want some thin spots where you can see through the white into the black because that's the way the car would have been lettered because those stock cars in that era, the guy just threw on quick numbers because next weekend you're going to probably be lettering it all over again. Yeah. So you weren't doing a custom car. Correct. You know what I mean? You weren't. I mean, let's face it, a lot of the cars today are way, way, way over-restored. And uh, while I, I get that, and I own a number of over-restored cars, the unfortunate thing is that you are rewriting history when you do that. Yes. Because then the young people go, wow, those cars were really nice back then. You go, no, it wasn't like this. <laughs> Not all okay? of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, most of these Ferraris that get restored, they never ran at the track the way they look today. And 
it's sort of sad because people go, wow, they Ferrari made some really nice. No, no, they were nice back then. I mean, I, there, were, yeah. there are pictures, and I've shown people pictures. The Ferrari delivered cars to the racetrack brand new with a dent in the rear fender that it might have picked up when they were unloading it. Yeah. And that's were, just the way it was. They were race cars. But they would yeah. they would never restore it with that dent in the rear fender. No. Because they, they go, ah, oh, I don't want to tell everybody. Well, that's the way it was. They go, well, yeah, but it, it's got a dent in it. You go, yeah, that's yeah. the way it was, guys, you know. it's That's part of it. Yesterday, let's see, Thursday, my dad and I went to the Speedway to yeah. see the vintage cars. And dad and I both do lettering. And that oh, was yeah, one of the good. things. <laughs> thank you. That was one of the things we were looking at all day is, man, look at the lettering on this car. Look at the lettering on this car. Because when it's done right, it's part of the whole package. It's just like a guy saying, look at the chrome on this car. Look at the wheels on this car. Oh, it's yeah. It's part of the package. It's all part look of it. Look, don't, I don't know if we've ever discussed this, but I'm a... I'm a sign geek, okay? Uh, I apprenticed at a sign shop for a summer. I wanted to be a sign painter. Uh, that was one of the first things. I mean, I know Pounce Pad. I know all the, I know all the mechanics. I was a flunky for these guys going out and all that. And these guys did show cards, uh, which is a complete, total lost art uh, because there's no way somebody will pay you for what you should get for a show card when you can hit a button, literally yes. a button on a computer <clears throat> after you put in everything and design everything yep. after all that time. Uh, but, you know, show card, I mean, the classic show card would be on black cardboard with fluorescent colors or whatever and white lettering and all that. Yep. And, I mean, just an amazing art. I mean, you talk about talent. And so I'm a, I'm a type nut, and I am a designer, <laughs> and I mean, I, I design packaging and, and, and other stuff. In the book, it shows a yeah, lot of that. Yeah. I loved seeing it. Yeah, so, really cool. I mean, I get all that, and I, I mean, that's been a, a big passion of my life. I mean, I, I, I've told my daughters, I said, you know, see that apartment right there? It, it, it's painted an ugly color, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, rather than just say a non-attractive it's it's come on it's <laughs> ugly okay i said you know what they didn't give those people a discount for buying an ugly color versus a nice color it would have cost no more to paint that building a nice color yeah right you're exactly right no more now if you don't know what a nice color is ask somebody yeah. okay or yeah. go find another mm -hmm. building that you like yeah shoot right. a picture of it <laughs> go to the paint store and say i want these colors okay exactly. and uh and so yeah no type type evokes emotion as you know you deal in the type world i mean whether it's sans serif with no little uh you know kick out letters you know feet at the bottom of the lettering or serifed which is like what you'd see on a bank or something like that very rigid looking or on the money or whatever or uh, uh, art deco or rounded or whatever the construction of letters it, it's it is it is truly an art and when you go through and there's you know thousands and thousands and thousands of different typefaces or uh, or another term we use fonts uh all for the same a all for the same <laughs> b the same g the same i that's pretty amazing it's a huge world of just it's it's amazing it's an, it's an endless ra rabbit hole it yeah really and you know italicized <laughs> and bold <laughs> and <clears throat> extended and then condensed amazing and then uh you know microgramma which is a a squatty you know yeah. very sort of uh structural round you know rounded but squared lettering you know and all that so yeah no it's, it's I, a huge part of it i love all that yeah no and then that, that's part of the emotion that you get from looking at those old cars that lettering was done a certain way, and, and particularly in the era we're talking about, it shows the emotion of the guy that actually lettered it a lot of times. Because he, it, particularly if you're going to do special, you know, that'll be some sort of a script. And the guy really, he said, yeah, I, I want to do it this way. And, and, and it shows the emotion. I mean, you're really capturing part of that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's them. I mean, it's it's no different than like a fingerprint. That's cool. you know what I mean. Yeah, that's so, your that's that makes a lot of sense because uh, around Cincinnati, I have people that can tell me all the time. I can spot your dad's lettering 
right away. Yeah, style. They know my dad's style. Yeah. Like dump trucks, wreckers all over Cincinnati. Yep. They know like, oh, that's Dan Shaw's lettering. Yeah. Because he has his own and, and that's style. And that's very true. And, and it, it's a good style, but it's cool that each well, guy has their own style. I think, like I that. think, you know, talking about this, when you're a person like yourself that's doing this, you sort of want a style. Yes. You don't want to yeah. be necessarily a machine. Yes. It's nice <clears> if you can be a machine, if you need to do that. But you also sort of want your style, just like Picasso had their style, Dolly had his his yeah, style, yeah. Uh, you know, any uh, Calder, cool. you know, they had their style. And and but let's face it, to come up with your own style is not an easy thing. Yeah, it's, it, it develops it, over years. That's it. I've had and, guys uh, uh, order. I've had guys come to me for T-shirts, and they've told me that exact thing. I want a T-shirt done by you or a logo done by you, and do you do that style lettering you do? And I, it's honorable. I like that. Yeah. And I see guys. I see other artists that try to emulate my style because they like it, and I'm not offended. That's it's a compliment. No, but but you know the <laughs> thing is, and 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 look at we all start out uh, emulating or copying other people. Yes. Okay, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean that's that's how you learn, and. Uh, but the ones that really reach greatness are the ones that then transition out of that and create their own style. Correct. You know, if you're familiar with Ed Ross t-shirt art, the monster art and all yeah. that, which I grew up on, and the lettering and all that, most of that was done by one of two people, Robert Williams or Ed Newton. Yes. And, uh, you know, those guys had particular style. And, and Robert Williams was a white shirt, black, tie madman type of guy when he went to work for Roth he came out of the ad agency type you know deal and then he has now morphed into years back fine artist with his you know it's unbelievable Amazing. paintings and yeah which we you know, all got the hot Nick, rod, yeah they're, there's yeah they're here around the yeah, shop where yeah yeah those are posters. those are they're iconic the and, hot, right uh, down there the hot rod race right down there oh yeah it's got the, yeah. the three hot rods racing and one's oh, yeah. crashing and every yeah. hot rod kid grew up with that on his wall oh yeah and the many faces <laughs> of the 32 ford and and all that and robert robert's a good friend of mine and uh just an amazing guy i mean the guy is unbelievably talented and how he comes up with this stuff <laughs> with the alien forms and all that and then the the girls, you know, dressed a certain way and all that. It's just like it's you're saying. what it's they call lowbrow style. art. Yeah. But lowbrow art sells for a very high price. <laughs> and, you know, Nicolas Cage owns a lot of his work. And, wow. uh, but so, yeah, that style, that your, your signature look. And, and it's the same way in fabrication, in everything yes. in life, really. Yes. You know what I mean? Certain, yeah. look at certain announcers, you know, like here we are on these microphones Certain announcers, uh, game show hosts, or whatever, they sign off a certain way. They have yeah. a certain look. You know, uh, they might wear a certain type of an outfit or whatever. You want to, you want to, no matter what it is you're doing, if you can, create that individuality. You don't want to be just another widget. Correct. And uh, because <clears throat> I can hire another widget. <laughs> you're exactly okay? right. I mean, but you want to be you. That's so. That's so true. That's yeah, very I mean, cool. you want to be one of a kind. With where we're at now, I want to start talking about you, um, and I want to. You know, we're going to get into what your first, your quarter midget history, and then mm -hmm. growing up. But at what do you remember when you first? I mean, racing families are are kind of a thing of their own, and a lot of guys listen to this grew up in racing families, and and racing families are always tight knit. And they do things a little different than everyone else in the neighborhood. How, how old were you when you realized your family wasn't the same as everyone else's? As far as, you know, you guys. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, something was special. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. I, how, young were you, <clears throat> how young were you when you were first in a quarter midget? Uh, pictures, like five. You're, yeah, you're yeah, very young. Yeah, five. And uh, there were. Curtis Quarter Midgets, uh, which uh, they originally bought to help Frank. And uh, my dad my dad and uncle, anytime Frank called and said, hey, I got this or whatever, uh, they uh, never failed to uh, support uh, the man that they considered to be a second father. Yeah. And 
I don't want I don't want this to come across as if like they looked at Frank as a charity case because if if somebody were to read that into what I'm saying that's wrong they respected Frank Curtis for good reason like no other and uh, they never ever failed to if Frank came like what the Curtis craft book by Ed Hitzey uh, I was there when Frank came by and said, hey, this guy's going to write a book, but, but I need to sell so many copies to make it financially viable. And uh, we bought several hundred copies of that book. Cool. Okay, Good. first edition, of which to me that's, several to, hundred that's were signed by, signed by Frank, yeah. of which I have like two now left. Uh, I mean, we gave one to A.J. Foyt's dad, Tony, signed by Frank. We gave one to Ivan Major, the 12-time world speedway champion. I mean, we we handed those things out like popcorn. And uh, I ran into Ed Hitsy's son, who I'd never met, and he seems to think the story's different. But anyway, whatever. <laughs> what, what you're you know, I mean, talking about, though, but, though but you're but preserving anyway, history. It's yeah, the same as donating yeah, to yeah. a museum. Yeah, yeah. But, it's you know, I mean, Look at to put a book out. I've pub. I've got a publishing company. I've published three books. Ours, family book being the last of, of the three. Prior to that, the Chrisman legacy on the Chrisman family, Bonneville drag drag racing, Indy, you know, et cetera, and then the Fulmer book on George Fulmer, and, and publishing's not a, uh, in particularly in today's world of uh, business where you're going to become you know, fabulously wealthy, unless you're selling somebody's memoir that's, uh, you know, just, I don't know, you know, <laughs> New York. read the news, yeah. okay? Just, yeah. you know, you know what I'm talking because about. So anyway, that kind yeah, of yeah, that type of, you know, <laughs> sullied stuff. And we're going to tell that some movie star was a yeah. ne'er-do-well. Since they're dead now, we can say anything about them, and they yep. can't defend themselves, and neither can their family. But anyway, so... So anyway, yeah, no, it's a it's a love thing. So no, I you know, I was around all these people, and I wasn't like collecting autographs or anything <laughs> or or getting pictures. I mean, it was just normal. And you know what is normal? Yeah. Okay, well, normal's whatever you're around. Okay, and uh, look, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Okay. And a lot of times that phrase is said with negative connotation. Yeah, you know, you can pick your fan, uh, f- friends, but you can't pick your family because somebody's got some crazy <laughs> uncle or aunt or whatever, and, and yeah. Thanksgiving's always when you get to experience <laughs> this, right? Yeah. So I, I look clearly, I was blessed to be born in the family I was born in, okay? And I was also blessed to acknowledge this at a, at a young age and not fight it. And also, I was blessed that I loved what I was born into and I didn't want to become uh, uh, something else, you know, like a doctor, which would have been obviously very admirable. Correct. We, we, you know, I mean, we need more doctors yeah. and et cetera. But, you know, I mean, it, it just... You know, again, you don't, there's so much in your life that you really cannot explain. I mean, look, at we all have control over a lot, okay? And, uh, and a lot of us don't exercise the control the way we should or at all. And uh, my, I was raised not to be a bobbing cork in the sea, okay? Uh, and my dad, uh, you know, my dad and I were best friends, but he was a tough guy. And uh, on the weekends, he'd, he'd say, hey, Ed, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go down the street and see my friend Bobby or, you know, whatever, Kenny or, you know, Ace, Cl- you know, Clark was a neighbor or whatever. No, nah, I don't think you're going to do that, Ed. No, nah, I I, you go down with them, you're going to get in trouble because my dad realized, <laughs> young adult male, okay, come on. And, uh, and I got in my share of trouble, that's for sure. I mean, I'm at, I'm at the Sammy Hagar uh, – <laughs> Uh, concert the other night that I went to on a serendipitous deal because uh, Sammy had a band called the Justice Brothers 
in the early part of his career, named after our, our company, okay? <laughs> and the bass player with Sammy now is Michael Anthony, who was the bass player with Van Halen originally. And, and Michael and I went to high school together. And so Michael, uh, backstage, he's telling everybody, guys from Foyt's team and et cetera, he goes, Ed was the biggest joker. And this guy was the biggest <laughs> prankster. So, okay, with all, that as a background, my dad would say, no, I don't think you're going down to your friends, okay? And he'd say, you're going to come with me, and you're going you're gonna to learn something. And, you know, he was right. And so a lot of my friends growing up uh, were my dad's friends. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, like Frank Curtis, at the beginning, I didn't quite realize. My dad would say, hey, you know, this guy is a very famous race car guy. He built some great race cars, et cetera, et cetera. And, but when you're young, look, at, you, don't, you, can't, you can't assimilate that. You can't factor it. You know, experience puts things in perspective. Again, the top of the mountain, the bottom of the valley type of thing again. And so as you start to mature, you start to realize and you see how people react around this guy and you go, wow, this guy really is something. And, uh, and so as, as I got older, yeah, more and more. Uh, and then I started saying, Hey, you know, I need to get autographs from these guys. I mean, they're not, you know, I mean, I got the, the mighty midgets book, which came, Jack Fox wrote, came out in 1977. I, I bought it at the Gilmore roars again party, which we sponsored. It was the ran for 30 years, put on by the Schroeder family, and, and we were sponsors of it for like 20 of the 30. Uh, and it was done for the benefit of injured drivers and that type of thing. And I got that book that night, and it's got Mickey Thompson's signature in it. It's got Cowboy O'Rourke. It's got wow. Emil Deet, Myron Stevens, who wow. built that Stutz Blackhawk car. Yeah. Um, oh, I got, a, I got a picture I can show you of it. I mean, uh, it got, it's got other people like, Foyt and Howard Gilbert, his engine man, who's now deceased, and and uh, God, wow. uh, Danny Oaks, uh, Poison Oaks. You know, he was a crew chief at Indy, and he also was a famous midget champion. Uh, Bullet Joe Garson. Wow. Uh, it's I mean, <laughs> bo- two pages of solid, four columns of autographs of majority of the people who are uh, A.J. Watson. He's he's in there, uh, you know, and and I. I'm glad I did that because it's not that I'm a, an autograph hound because I found a lot of that stuff three generations from now, somebody may not care about, but it sure brings back great memories for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Of people I, I really respected. So yeah. So it, it that, your book illustrates that amazing. Uh, the, the photos alone in your book are just mind blowing. But what I, one of the things I took away from it, I just kept thinking to myself, man, this guy, you, this guy was there for so many things. And and you see in the book, you know, pictures of the winter circle and it's your dad and your uncle and these famous drivers. And then there's you and you're 12 years old standing there. And it's just amazing the stuff that you were a part of. Uh, and I was going to ask you, you know, were, were you, because some racing families, the Hoffman racing family, Richard, I've talked to him and, uh, he he would tell me growing up that he was allowed in the shop but he wasn't allowed to touch anything he had to sit on a stool in the corner and he couldn't touch anything and work on anything until he got like 17 18 years old and it seems like your story you were way more involved you were oh, yeah. right in yeah there. no my dad I mean, there's told... pictures of you making signs at the factory oh and, yeah and no no my stuff, dad uh which is great yeah well you know that's the way ed roth's sons were ed roth had five boys and uh, I always joke with people, the thing about your kids is you can overwork your kids and you won't be thrown in jail. <laughs> but if it's your neighbor's kid, you'll be thrown in jail, okay? Yeah. yeah. And so your, your family can be like legal uh, <laughs> slave labor, oh, my okay? My dad's favorite saying is that's what they make boys for. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, uh, when Ed Roth was doing all those cars, uh, his boys were throwing the fiberglass on out in the shop. And, and that's the way I grew up. Good. I'm in the factory. I'm, I'm there, you know, helping to blend the products. And, uh, and I'd come home and my mom would take, make me take the clothes off outside the house because I had <laughs> such a solvent odor and everything else. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I, it's like working at a paint shop, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, so yeah, no, I, my dad, uh, 
he was very, very, very free with me uh, on that. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and he, he's, you know, he's what got me into photography and, uh, you know, helped me with that. And just, you know, it, it's basically trying to find things to uh, educate your child and also at the same time keep them out of trouble yeah you know i mean that's That's... what sports is for a lot of people my dad was a great football player he was a great sportsman but he didn't want me to do any of that okay funny enough he had broke his nose he had done a lot of things he had been beat up and he said ed i don't want you to get to my age and have aches and pains he says it's just not worth it and so uh he he didn't he highly discouraged me to play football highly discouraged me to do all that other stuff uh racing was it and or drawing uh you know another thing that i morphed from the sign thing was cartoonist and uh and uh, i you know i got, had my one deal by sergio aragonis resigned the other day he did the marginals you know in mad magazine <laughs> yeah yeah what a cool guy but anyway uh you know and i grew up on mad magazine like a lot of people and all that and all, all those artists i would draw and emulate and copy and you know how does this guy construct his nose to this guy and all that yeah. and and so you know my dad was just trying to expose me to everything and and, and i've come to the conclusion after looking at my life and a lot of other people's lives that that 10 11 12 years of age for uh kids is a is a really sort of seems to be a critical age where that might be when you pick up what you're going to do for your life or or very jimmy page of led zeppelin you know started playing guitar at 10 years of age i mean you 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 look at a lot of people now there's a late bloomers too. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but for a lot of people, and and a lot of what I was doing at that time frame is what I've done for most of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So or, or it's always been there. It's always if it's if it hasn't been the main narrative, it's always been an underlying yeah. narrative. Yeah. That's when you find things that you're going to be passionate about. Yeah. Something well, and that's that you why you know ever, it's it's a good time kick. if you have the ability to try and expose your kids to as much as possible. You know, I mean, I took organ lessons uh, as a kid, not by choice, okay? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's when a, the organ was not cool. They didn't, they didn't have what we call now keyboards, okay? Yes, yeah. The organ was what you saw at church yeah. or, you know, or at, at uh, the old folks' home or whatever. It's like, hey, I play the organ. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, okay. organ and cool in yeah, that era yeah. were like at opposites, okay? But I did recitals, and I did. All, I learned how to read music, and so I thought my escape from playing an organ would be to say I wanted to play the guitar, because who didn't want to play the guitar, particularly in my youth, yeah. with the Beatles coming on, you know, I mean... I, I uh, and all that other stuff that I think the chicken's done now. <laughs> yeah. anyway, that was anyway. my reminders of yeah. what I got to do on the yeah, way to yeah. Anderson. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but and I, I found out the guitar was not for me. I still have my Fender Mustang that I bought, and uh, I found out wow, it, playing this guitar, man. Uh, if you're right-handed and you're going to strum with the right hand, the left hand it gets pretty sore pushing those strings <laughs> down, and and that's when I really transition then into into the photography and from the artwork and why photography really appealed to me was because I'm going to the track with my dad and I could be doing something at the track and you know uh so yeah I uh that was something that another thing I took away from the book was you you get this camera and it's not only are you young and you're energetic and and you're interested but unlike a lot of other grown adults you had access to oh it's unbelievable well not only access to garages but you could walk into the garage and know the crew chief and know those guys that that changed everything and that kid with the camera looks pretty harmless you know what i mean and and uh it wasn't a cell phone world that we live in today and you didn't have social media and the picture wasn't going to end up somewhere where it's going to cause a problem correct you know what i mean and there were less attorneys, and there weren't as many lawsuits, and the insurance companies weren't worried about getting sued. And, yeah. and so, it, you know, it was a perfect storm. And for, uh, it for, was a great time, really. It was a really, really great time. For photography people that would listen to this, um, 
you're a very well-known photographer and racing photography. What explain to him what your first camera was and how that? Well, my first camera was yeah, which a, I know you still have. Yeah, Con, <laughs> is a Konica Auto S2, and it's funny we we sponsored the Cadillac uh, Wayne Taylor Cadillac that's sponsored by Konica Minolta. Two wow. brands I'm very familiar with for 50 <laughs> years. They don't make cameras anymore. And Minolta sold their camera system to Sony, and that's what Sony is now. The genesis of the Sony cameras came from Minolta, wow, okay. which Minolta at one time was a huge selling. The mind of Minolta was their, their selling. It was a great camera, great technology, uh, long before Canon. Okay. Canon sort of, in my life, more of a late bloomer. Okay. Uh, but uh and i so it was a konica auto s2 you could not change the lens it was a fixed lens what they call a range finder where you bring the two images together to make one and that means it's in focus uh, which is similar to the iconic leica which i've shot over the years and i shoot today uh, and so yeah that camera i ended up giving to my mom in trade for the last payment of on a car that i bought and I convinced her that uh, they had loaned me a small amount of money to, uh, along with what I had, to buy this car. It was a 1972 Porsche 914, four-cylinder, in case anybody wonders. It's not <laughs> yeah. the six, okay? <laughs> I could barely afford the four, okay? <laughs> so anyway, uh, I convinced her, and of course, you know, I, I, it wasn't like I pulled any wool over anybody's <laughs> eyes, Okay. <laughs> Uh, I said, you don't have a camera, and this camera's worth X, and my payment's worth this, and how about I just give you this camera, and that'll be the end of this whole deal. And and she said, yeah, great. So anyway, and I've got that camera. Yeah, it's very cool. And, and uh, You've still got the Porsche, too, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I still do. That's a car that my wife and I met when I was driving it, and we dated in that car, and my wife's the only reason we still have the car. That's cool. Yeah, so anyway... Uh, yeah, so then I got a Pintex Spotmatic, and that was imported by Honeywell Corporation, which was a big company back in the day. It was made by a company called Asahi in, in Japan, and the Pintex Spotmatic and the Minolta SRT-101 were the two big consumer cameras, and they were interchangeable lenses. So that was a big transition. Now, okay. now I had the ability to get a <clears throat> telephoto, et cetera. And then I went from that, I bought a Nikon F, which is an iconic camera, and 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 I bought the motor-driven one, which was the first factory motor-driven camera that Nikon made. And and back then, the pros used Nikon. Canon was not even a factor. Canon was number one seller in in Japan, but number one seller in America was Nikon. Wow. And uh, Canon did a very good job. Then later coming along, and today, look at they're interchangeable in my opinion. I, I own both. I shoot primarily Nikon and Leica now, and I, I, I shot Hasselblad, the camera that went to the moon back in the day. Wow. But that's, that's a, you know, that day, that time and this time, uh, there's certain things that are in common in photography, always will be aperture, shutter speed, you know, that type of thing, uh, film speed, ISO, uh, ISO, ASA, whatever you want to call it. Like, like the older racers and crew chiefs you had, were meeting, were there older, very experienced photographers that were taking you under their wing yeah, and there showing were. you? Yeah, and, I, and I've never forgotten that. And I do the same thing with the young guys today. You know, you pay it back, they paid it forward, et cetera. Uh, they, yeah, uh, Leslie Lovett, who was the photographer at, for NHRA, uh, who died, unfortunately, at way too young of an age from a heart attack. Uh, he was a great friend. My, the absolute first mentor I had, Mert Miller, who ended up shooting my wedding. Oh, that's okay, cool. He was a motorsports <laughs> photographer. He tell me I'm not part of this, okay? That's perfect. And, and But he was a very, very good <laughs> photographer. And he this this man had a big impact on my life, uh, religious-wise and otherwise. He, he was a great guy. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him. My, my dad recognized he was a trustworthy gentleman, and, uh, and I mean, I used to drive to the races with him and all. He was the wow. photographer at Irwindale Drag Strip. Oh, wow. I wanted to get his job. Yeah. Uh, clearly, I knew I wasn't <laughs> going to get his job. So the job came up to be the writer. 
Now, I'm not a writer, particularly when I was in high school. Now, understand, I started shooting for the magazines at 14. Wow. No joke. Yeah. At 14. That picture you saw of me is at, at 15. And uh, it was different. You know, I mean, that's just, uh, I got to tell you, it was different back then. And so uh, the guy, Tim Marshall, who's now since deceased, he was leaving the job as writer for Irwindale. And Mert suggested that I be the, given the job. And again, I was in high school. I got paid 35 bucks a week to write the column for National Dragster and Drag News and a free hamburger. <laughs> and the hamburger, yeah, and the, you know, the guy who was the financing behind uh, Irwindale Drag Strip was a guy by the name of Harry Snyder, who was the founder of In-N-Out Burger. Oh, wow. So the hamburgers at Irwindale <laughs> were, no joke, In-N-Out in cool. Burgers. But most people didn't know that. And, and, and I didn't like hamburgers at that time. I'd get a hot dog. So <laughs> anyway, whatever. So, you know, uh, anyway, so yeah, no. At, and so I, every week I would have to write that darn story, what happened at the track. And oh my gosh, it was so, because come on, adult, uh, I mean, a, a adolescent male, uh, English is not generally for most of us unless you turn out to be Stephen King or somebody like this. For most guys, it's more mathematics and and for and I'm not trying to be stereotypical here, but for for, for most girls, it's more English, okay? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so writing was not <laughs> something that I. But you know what? I how did I learn how to write? I emulated other writers. I read what they wrote, and I emulated their writing. And uh, you know, hey, it was a just a report on what happened at the track, and so you, nobody's going to get hurt. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You know, Probably so. still skills you use today, though. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love to write now. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, right, and and I and I think communication skills are critical. I I I really wish we would just focus more on the reading, writing, and arithmetic in school, and really produce students out of high school that are very proficient just in those three things. It can get you very far in life if you can just totally be able to talk and be writing, able to say being what able you to mean. write the right way and being able to speak the right way is very very critical i agree very critical um one of a, we both know a young man named cameron who's a young photographer great and, guy. and he looks up to you what is uh what's three or four maybe five tips you can give young racing photographers guys well, that want to shoot race cars yeah shoot a lot uh, okay. and, Experience. and there's a lot of events, you know, the, the big question always is, well, how do you get a credential? Well, look at, don't go to the big events to start out. I mean, I shot a lot of little league. I, you know, I mean, I, my, I still say this today, if it moves, I'll shoot it. And it sounds like a bad hunter, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, the more you shoot like anything, the better you get, you got to make all those mistakes. And the more mistakes you make, the more you're not going to make that mistake. And nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to die in the process. You use yeah. your head. I mean, I look at I was schooled very much where not to stand, where to stand by my dad. You know, he, you know, he said, "Look, Ed, I got saw this guy get killed by a loose wheel, and you know what I mean. Always put something between you and the moving object, and don't." Yeah. Don't stand where the car goes out to the wall like at Indy, yeah. where they're one foot off the wall. Yeah. Probably not a good place to stand, you know what I mean, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, Racetrack etiquette. Yeah, you stand on the inside of the turn <laughs> is clearly safer than the outside of the turn. You yeah. know, And, of course, now you have long lenses that can isolate you much further away from the problem, et cetera. But, yeah, no, I mean, it's like, look, at a few years ago, in fact, it was 2016. Uh, the 100th anniversary of the Indy 500. I, I shot the race here uh, with because we sponsored Towns and Bell. He sat on uh, the pole in uh, second row, Andretti Racing. We led the race for a while. It really had a – he and Ryan Hunter Ray were the, the toast of the field, but they had a little uh, run-in in the pits, and that was sort of the end of that deal. Wow. And so anyway, but the next weekend, I'm up at Laguna Seca Raceway in, in Monterey, California, at a Porsche Carrera Cup regional race, and I mean, there is nobody there other than the competitors. And I and immediately I said to myself, "This is where the young photographers you come to these deals, 
Nobody's out there. Look, at, I started by su- uh, shooting drag races week in, week out, and I was very lucky living in Southern California at the golden age. Yes. I mean, I, they, they call everything the golden age, but this truly was the golden age. That we had the match racing yeah, days. Yeah, Irwindale, oh, Orange County, and Lions Drag Strip. And any weekend, one of them had a race going. They rotated through. And, you know, I mean, there's a picture that was just ran in Haggerty's magazine of 32 funny cars at the big funny car meet at, at Orange County. That means 16 first-round races, 32 funny cars. And they're all that's, big names. Yeah, that's it's, double the size of the field at a national event today. Okay, and, and most of those cars were local Southern California-based cars, which is amazing to think of. I mean, people think you're lying until you show them the picture today. And so I, I would shoot all that stuff, and then I'd make prints, and I'd go into the, the – uh, the pits and sell prints to the the competitors cool. and uh you know i mean look at i was making money it's you can't support a family doing that but i'm a young guy i i was doing other things and that's what the guy should do today yeah. you know you don't you you gotta do the foundation you gotta do the grunt work you gotta be the apprentice you gotta you know have the mentor you gotta do whatever and one thing I see about Cameron is that he is shooting all the time and he's shooting these Midwest dirt races, et cetera, et cetera. He's always got his camera with him, and that's the way hmm. I am still to this day. And uh, you just got to do it because, you know, the old adage is if you're not practicing, somebody else is. And when you meet that person, they're going to beat you. And so, that's good theory. Yeah, like that. it is. So you got to keep. My dad used to say, "Look, at, in order to sharpen the knife, you got to rub against the rocks and the and the stone." And and doing this is constantly keeping your knife sharp. So, go to all these small events. You know, find out when they're running this, running that. Uh, and look, at, it's a little bit different world. You can figure out other th- ways to sell the photography. Put it on a mug or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You, the, the deal is you own the image. And, uh, and there's a whole issue with that today. But, but anyway, I think this gives somebody, you just got to shoot a lot. Good. You got to shoot a lot. Go Good. out. There's a lot of grassroots racing that, uh, and if, you know what, like if you go to the track and you say to the track owner, and, and it's some deal where you say, look, it, I'll supply you photos for free if you give me a credential to go down and shoot. And so it's always the toughest is how do you get that first deal if you don't have something to show that you can do the job? So you got to do that. And if it's, if it's hanging over a fence at a road race, like a lot of these road race tracks, uh, you, can go, you can go to Home Depot and buy a one-foot step stool which I have done many times. I, look, at I've proven to many people uh, when I, even though I can get a credential, I've proven I didn't get a credential. And uh, I'll, I'll fly into the area, go to Home Depot, buy that step stool with the intention of leaving it behind, <laughs> giving it to somebody, okay? Because, yeah. you know, it's with 20, 30 bucks, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and like at Daytona, the 24 hours of Daytona, with a step stool, you if you got the talent, you can get a lot of great pictures, and so you shoot under those conditions to build your portfolio. You can do it at Road Atlanta, uh, Elkhart Lake is a great track in Wisconsin. I mean, fantastic Laguna Seca, uh, you know, Long Beach obviously mm-hmm. not particularly. Although I do know guys that shoot Long Beach without a credential and come away with some great photography. Yeah. So. You know, how bad do you want it? Yes, exactly. You know, how bad do you want it? How, yeah. how, how hard are you willing to work for it? Uh, don't expect somebody to deliver this to you on a silver platter because it's just not going to happen. You know, how resourceful are you? I mean, it's, it's the other night, uh, Aaron Hagar, Sammy's son, got me all set up on the credential, and I get down there, and the, the line is literally three blocks long, and I text Aaron, and I said, Hey, I don't think I'm going to be able to get in and meet this guy to go backstage. By he, and he texted back to me, buddy, you're going to have to go to work and figure it out. And because and, uh, he, you know, he's he's in in, in uh, Tahoe where yeah. he lives, and I'm in Indianapolis. And I said, I texted back to him, 
okay, I'm good with that. Yeah. And uh, so. Been there before. I, yeah, I, I found a way in. Good. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So how bad do you want it, you know? You're exactly right. What is, uh, do you have a favorite track to shoot at? Well, you know, I love Wait, it. I mean, I know there's. I, Different. Yeah, Probably you know, different, look at the problem. The pro- track, yeah, the favorite. problem at a lot of these tracks, and and this is the thing that the, a lot of the young guys it's hard for them to realize is it's so changed from when I started. Yes. We had access. I mean, literally at the first Long Beach Grand Prix, we were hanging out over the K rail, no <laughs> catch fence, and no one cares. Yeah, no. I posted a you picture. Heard, that's your. That's on you. Yeah. That's right. And you know what? And and I also will say, I don't know anybody, and I've known. The majority of the top photographers shooting motorsports, not one of them's ever been hurt. Yeah, it just doesn't. Okay, yeah. let alone killed. Okay, so a lot of these things that they're protecting us from today, they didn't exist. There's no reason. Yeah. Nobody, you know, I mean, it's well said. You, you put a Hans right. device. That was a reason for a Hans device. Yeah. There's a reason for a roll cage. There's a reason for arm restraints. Uh, a lot of the restrictions that have been put on photographers, there's been no reason for that. Too much what if. Yeah, it's a one in a million. Yes. Come on. I'm, I'm, I you, totally you know, agree. And, and so just because it could happen doesn't mean it will happen. And so like Indianapolis, look at when NASCAR came to Indy, it changed the track. For the photographer, not good. Really? Put up the high fences. Oh, yeah. On the inside, everything. When Grand Prix yeah. came, the inside of turn one and two, we used to walk down there, and you had a free shot with a long lens. It was totally safe. When the road course came in there, now you can't go down there anymore. Yeah. That was a tradition that was killed at Indy sure. for no good reason. Yeah. It, they, they, and look, it, it's like when they tore down the Speedway Motel. It, they, uh, most of us that were around for that feel like they ripped the heart out of out of the the culture of the I've track heard a lot of guys say, oh yeah say no no talk about that it, it's because everybody was there close to the track yeah. i mean i did lloyd ruby was a big uh magic enthusiast a lot of people didn't know this and i'm a magician and some people know this some people don't we put one page in the book just to acknowledge <laughs> that and uh and I mean, I sat by the pool doing magic tricks with Lloyd Ruby. And, wow. and uh, I mean, I remember when PJ and Paige Jones were, you know, like five and six, and I'd go to Parnelli and Judy's room, and the kids were running around on the bed, bouncing on the bed, <laughs> running and bouncing <laughs> off the walls. And, I mean, it was, you don't have that now. Now everybody's scattered out all over the city, and there's no real common meeting place. Uh, so I can remember this is early 2000s, maybe few years before they tore it down a group of buddies and i maybe six of us came up to indianapolis on a normal weekend middle of winter to hang out with another buddy and i told my buddies i said we got to go stay at this hotel just for no other reason than we have to say we did it and it was for that because we knew it was yeah it was gonna be gone yeah so and, anyway uh, it's you just know, sad but. yeah back on the photography now the fences and all that so it's changed it a lot so a favorite track uh i I love I love Elkhart Lake. Uh, first of all, it's it, it clearly is one of the best managed tracks in the U.S. The really? way that it's structured with the ownership, people own parts of it, yeah. and the facilities, the restrooms, the gift shop, uh, etc. It's really, really, it's 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 a uh, it's an amazing deal, and I'm not. I don't say this to knock other tracks because I know most of the people that run the other tracks. Okay. They're putting in a new tower at road Atlanta now. Wow. Uh, Laguna Seca. I've known the management at Laguna Seca, uh, present and past, uh, for a number of years. And they're, they've done a lot of things and they're doing a lot of things to upgrade that track. It's an icon. I, these tracks, none of them, uh, should ever be lost. They mm-hmm. all are, to me, icons of that need to be preserved. Historical monuments that yeah. we race at. Yeah. Obviously, Indianapolis. I think they do a tremendous job at Indy. And uh, but again, because of a lot of things, I, I look at. I love stock car racing. A big part of our our history and our family. But if they show up at a road course, 
you're going to get high fences and it's going to change the culture of the track. And, yeah. and uh, I hate to see that, to yeah. be quite honest. Yeah. And I uh, never thought about that. El- Elkhart you Lake, that. It changes you know, the layout, changes everything. Everything, everything. Because huh. it just, you got these massive big pieces of steel now. And uh, again, uh, look at Coda. I don't like that track. Okay. Uh, you know, you'll find mixed opinions on Coda. Coda is built in the modern Grand Prix track. The restrictions for the photographers are off the charts. You basically, if you look at the photography that comes out of Circuit of the Americas, it'll be one of four pretty much iconic shots. The start coming up the hill, the one with the tower in the background. Yeah. There's only like I'm four shots. I'm picturing in my head, and you're no, right. No, seriously. I'm <laughs> telling right. you. No, they don't. They could care less about uh, having great photography come out of there. And see, I think that's just very short sighted of the that track. Can help people spread the word. It's advertising. Absolutely, yeah. that's the whole deal. And you want great history to be captured out of uh, drag racing. Unfortunately, today a, a lot of the pictures now have a lot of clutter in the background that we didn't deal with when I first started. Correct. And so. Uh, you know, and I, I don't really shoot much drag racing anymore. I've got guys that are are good friends that are good photographers. And look at I buy photography from other photographers. I like to support other guys because mm-hmm. it's it's gotten a lot tougher. Wow. It's gotten a lot tougher to be a photographer as far as making a living, and uh, and that's for a lot of reasons that might be obvious and others that maybe aren't so obvious. But I think Cameron's learning right now. One of the the, the entry level ways of doing it is if you could just pay for your trip to the racetrack that day that's huge that's awesome and that's not easy that's no yeah but that's a you're huge right. part of it you're you know? right if you could go take a few pictures yeah, enjoy a right. race and pay for your trip and your hot dog and your tank of gas that's yeah. you you're, you're right you're Cu- right a couple more things and then we'll let you go and um tell us about your museum i got to visit it and you you've done an amazing job preserving so much history and not just open wheel history. You've got motorcycles in there, hot rods, yeah, sports drag cars, racing, everything. Yeah. How did the uh, when was when did you come up? When did you just do the museum? How well, 1985 about? is when my dad and I decided to start uh, what was going to be a collection of four cars, uh, <laughs> primarily yeah, primarily all on loan, uh, which is not the case today. And it's sort of like the way our life has gone. It it wasn't a plan. You just, you started out, and uh, I think I might have told you when you were out there that one guy gave my dad a gas pump, a vintage gas pump as a, as a gift. Now we've got over 200 of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just sort of happened organically, and uh, I think that's part of the appeal of our place, maybe. And you could tell me a lot better than me because uh, I'm too close to it. Yeah. And, and uh, it's not in a big tilled up, very sterile building. Uh, the one part is in a block building, more modern. Uh, and then we go into the other building, which is very old school, feels like you're in somebody's garage uh, type of thing. And I, and I think, you know, over the years, I've come to the conclusion from what people have told me that that's a very warm feeling rather than a very high ceiling. Because yes. I've been in a lot of those collections. And it just, it, it, you know, look, it, I can take some people to some museums and it's row after row after row after row of amazing cars, historic cars. And after maybe a row and a half or two rows most people that I might take there are numb. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, oh my you're gosh! You're exactly right. I, I, okay, I've seen the car <laughs> thing now, and you can see it in them. And it's like, okay, hey, you guys, you want to go get lunch now? Yeah, you're exactly <laughs> and, right. And and I don't get that from what people tell me about ours. And and maybe it's because it's close to our family, and and people feel the soul. Uh, in it and uh they feel the passion or whatever i don't know and i'm not saying this as any sort of like uh, bragging or whatever yeah okay but i've tried to figure it out and 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 i'm not the only one in our family trying to figure out why people have said the things they've said to us about our collection because look at clearly there i know a lot of people that have collections that are worth way more 
money. Okay, but we've never, I, I, first of all, I don't buy cars as an investment. Okay, I don't. Uh, I don't, that's just not my deal. Uh, I think collecting some cars may be a terrible investment, okay? Yeah. Uh, because it, it changes like the wind. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. this year hot rods are hot. Next year muscle cars are hot. Next year it's this. Yeah. I mean, now pickups are hot deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. What, what's going to be hot next year at the auctions? You know, God only knows. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like musical chairs. If you buy, if you buy into what's hot this year, uh, you might be the guy left without the seat when it comes to selling your car. It can burn you. Oh, big time. Yeah. And, I mean, look at, you know, right now, uh, vintage American cars of certain era, the market's basically flat. Yeah. Uh, which I think is a great thing for people who want to get into the, in, the deal. I agree. Because... I, I will always try to tell people, look, at, if you're going to buy a car, because a lot of people ask me, well, how could I get into this? And they, they don't want to buy have a collection. They just want to have, like, one car, okay, to have fun. It only takes one, okay? Yes. You don't have to hold. I, I, I try to explain to people that actually owning a lot of cars is can be a little bit of a burden. And, and they always, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. You're getting sympathy from me. But they don't get it, and some do get it. But... I always tell them, look, don't don't necessarily go for the 32 Ford. Don't go for the 40 Ford. You're going to pay premium money maybe for those. You know, uh, like now, 37 Ford, which my dad and his era wouldn't have give you a plug nickel as the expression went uh-huh. for. They considered it to be probably the ugliest Ford ever built, maybe 35. You know, the odd years were the mm-hmm. ugly years. And uh, now, though, today's generation love 37 Fords and that's what the PT Cruiser is really a copy of is a 37 Ford yeah. which used to grind my dad like no other because <laughs> the 36 <laughs> is is a better looking car and he always say Ed the designer of that PT Cruiser why didn't he copy the 36 <laughs> I mean what what copy was he thinking <laughs> yeah right but anyway but you know the thing is you you can take any car and have fun with it and if you're not worried about winning the popularity contest, which I think controls too many people when it comes to this stuff, you can take an old Rambler station wagon. Maybe it's got wood sides on it. it let's say it's a steel-bodied car. And have somebody like you, Josh, door letter it, uh, Happy Days Resort, and do some great graphic on the door. And you know what? Just by doing that, now you got a cool car. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Or, gonna, or make it a cab have, or whatever. Yeah. You're going to have conversation with people Absolutely. everywhere you Throw go. Throw some decals on the rear window. Yep. Uh, go find the old cooler chest. Go find the old mm-hmm. uh, plaid uh, blanket. Yep. You know, decorate the car. Set dress it, as they would say in the movies. Mm-hmm. And then people are going to go, that is so cool. We, you mentioned to me when we were at your museum a really good scenario that I, stuck with me. You were telling Bobby Green and I, the difference of the attitude and the the looks you get when you climb out of a, a hot rod, yeah, or versus a hot rod, yeah. yeah, and it's just night and day. It is night and day. I mean, the hot rod, as you're I told guy. you guys, you're the same yeah, guy, dressed the same way, <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's so it's so funny because I've experienced it, and and I uh, and when you experience it, you watch and you see it. The you know the hot rod. The 32 Ford, the hot rod, the 39 standard coupe, you know, which was not be consi- you know, considered the one I have, a hot rod, because it's more stock. But that car is like the, uh, the puppy dog, as I told you guys. <laughs> Everybody wants to pet it. You know, <laughs> they, they get a smile and, oh, hey, come here. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, it's, it, 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 it engages conversation. Whereas other cars disengage conversation. They, you know, the, the hot rods, the certain cars bring people in. Other cars push people away. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, look, at, uh, the car is a melting pot. It's a great way to become part of a community and meet friends and go on fun things. And it just becomes... Uh, and no pun intended, a vehicle to those things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, car clubs. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not a real car club guy because I've, I've got so much other going on in the automotive world. But 
Car clubs are great. I get tours to a lot of car clubs when we can fit them in. Uh, unfortunately, not as many as people would like, but, but you know, there's the Corvette Club, then there's the Sprite Club, then there's the Triumph Club, and then there's the Porsche Club, and then there's the uh, AMC Pacer Club, or, you know, you <laughs> might even probably have a Yugo Club. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know what I mean? There's everything. I mean, yeah. you know, you, I always felt Yugo was the only car you could really joke about and not offend anybody. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I always say to people, you know, a guy walks into the auto parts store and he says to the guy behind the counter, hey, do you have a radiator cap for a Yugo? And the guy behind the counter says, no, but it sounds like a fair trade. <laughs> and so, anyway, I, I, so I said this joke on the microphone at a Concours I was announcing at and some guy comes up to me oh, and he no. goes, hey, buddy, what's the deal about ripping on you? <laughs> you that one guy. <laughs> I know, right? I go, what do you mean? I go, who who likes Yugos? And he goes, hey, I own three of them. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I said to him. I said, that's your fault, buddy. Yeah. That's your problem, Unreal. okay? There's counseling for that. Unreal. That's so anyway, great. he'll probably be the only Yugo owner. You know, give it about another 20 years, and those will probably be the only three left that didn't oh, go to yeah. the crusher. Unreal. So Unreal. Anyway. Ed, thank you so hey, much. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. This has been great. Uh, we're gonna. I'm heading up to the Little 500. And Good. I know you've got a busy weekend yep. ahead of you. Oh yeah. Who all are you uh, rooting for this weekend? Well, we're we're tied in uh, for the third year with Dreyer Reinbold. Uh, One of the yeah. oldest American team still. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Going. It's such a great partnership for us to be part of that team that because I respect. Of course, the Dreyer family are good friends of mine, Junior, and 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 that, and we've got a Dreyer in our collection. In fact, we've got a car we bought from Junior, and we've got another one that. Uh, pop dryer 30 30s vintage uh big car and uh dennis reinbold of course is part of that family and and dennis has got the passion we originally sponsored dennis's team back with robbie buell way 90 whatever uh, when they had the purex sponsored cars and we were associate sponsor on that and three years ago we reconnected uh, it was right after that we did the deal with the andretti and uh and which was a great great deal i mean uh you know look at andretti they sort of got indianapolis figured out modern day <laughs> yeah and uh so uh we got uh, jr hildebrand and sage Karam and good. both good i mean look at uh jr finished just out of the top 10 last year sage was gonna be top 10 maybe top five until he ran over some debris from castro nevis's crash that they had missed mm -hmm. and got a tire puncture and you know i mean Part of racing. That, yeah yeah and so i mean this will be our 74th year of participation wow. out of 103 we we hold the record according to what they tell me that's uh, amazing yeah and so well you know you can't stop now no and, and <laughs> you know and look at we love it it is indianapolis is like no other and uh it's you know i when you consider how many times i've been back here and the length of time I've been back here for trips, I've spent a significant amount of my life in Indianapolis, Indiana. Yeah. It yeah. is almost literally like wow. a second home to me. And, uh, you know, a long, long time ago, I started turning down the maps from the rental car counter, you know. <laughs> but anyway, That's cool. yeah, so, yeah, no, so that we're, we're hoping the guys do good. And look, at let's, it's anybody's race this. I mean, obviously, Penske and Andretti and Ganassi are, you know, always at the top of the favorites list. But I tell you, it's the tightest field in the history of the race. And uh, it's going to come down to, and this is like stating the obvious for some, but maybe not so obvious for others, uh, the team that makes the least amount of mistakes and has a certain amount of good luck. Excellent. And, uh, you know, you stay on the lead lap. And uh, <clears throat> least amount of mistakes is both on the track and in the pits. Yes. And uh, look at, we know anything can happen in the pits. I mean, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of Mario winning. And as you know, that entire race, they couldn't take the right rear tire off the car. And the car was overheating and... <clears throat> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 that's the part of the challenge as, uh, for a lot of us are really deep into racing is how do you manage these obstacles and challenges? And, uh, that's how you win. Yeah. Yes. You know, that's how you win. I mean, you know, Wayne Taylor, they won Sebring wow. a few years ago. They, they qualified like eighth on the grid and they won the race and they were, they were eighth slowest. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah. <laughs> you know, eighth from the fastest. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, all the fast cars went out for any number of reasons. They shot themselves in the foot, et cetera, et cetera. Bad tire management, you know, et cetera. And, uh, and I, that's why I love, I, I love uh, watching uh, WTR uh, because I tell you what, they are unbelievable, those guys. I just so admire the, the, the talent on that team from the drivers all the way to the backup and the pits and all that. And Wayne, is a, he's, he's a passionate racer. He hates to lose. You know, he showed me a good loser, and I'll show you a, good lo- I'll show you yep. a loser, yep, right, exactly. as the saying goes. Exactly and, right. uh, but I'll tell you, if they, lose, if they lose a race or something doesn't go right, boy, it's, it generally, in my opinion, is not their fault. It, it's, I mean, because wow. they, they can generally make lemonade out of lemons. Excellent. You know, wow. so anyway. Josh, I, I really appreciate getting this chance. And, and uh, you know, I, just as a final thing to your listeners, I hope that they follow their dreams. And, uh, you know, you live in America and, in my opinion, the greatest country. And uh, just go out and make it happen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.